Thank you very much, Vice President General Woods, for that kind introduction. Um, my thanks to Jack Warren for this invitation to speak with you all today, and particularly to the Jones family for providing such an, an exciting occasion. I owe a great debt of thanks to the Society for supporting my work with two research fellowships in your fascinating and unique collection at Anderson House. I'm particularly grateful to the advice and expertise of Ellen McAllister Clark, the library director there. My book, Becoming Men of Some Consequence, examines how long-term military service shaped young men in revolutionary America and how their time in the Continental Army in turn shaped them. My study sees young soldiers as key actors in the war for independence. In the second year of the war, a British officer tellingly jotted down his low opinion of the colonial rabble in arms. Clearly, he writes in his diary, clearly the leaders of the rebellion had used flattering prospects to fill their army with poor men who fought only for the sake of present subsistence, clothing, and plunder, and for the prospect of acquiring some property and becoming men of some consequence. That pretension becoming men of some consequence, struck this British gentleman as ridiculous. His offhand quip, however, named the profound logic connecting military service with young men's path along the male life course. Rather than mere short-term rewards of subsistence or plunder, going to war might satisfy their community's expectations, advance their economic prospects, elevate their relationships, and hopefully establish their peacetime independence. The hope of becoming men of some consequence shaped the military service of young men in revolutionary America. Let me start with a story of young revolutionaries that I find particularly revealing of how they thought about themselves and how they thought about the war that surrounded them. The story starts with them seeking out a fortune teller. They sought out the fortune telling woman in the war's fifth summer. 23-year-old Dr. Zuriel Waterman his older brother George, their younger friend Jonathan Rice, they had already seen their Rhode Island home become the seat of war with a British occupation in 1776. This war brought new opportunities and new demands. After just two months of medical training, Zuriel Waterman uh, signs on as a doctor, as a surgeon in, uh, in a regiment of the United States. Um, he then turns out again with the local militia in 1778. But life goes on despite the war's disruptions. And these three young men in 1779 in the summer thought it would be a lark to get a sense of how their lives could unfold. Their fortune teller spoke of wives and war. Zuriel described her as an old fat woman, naturally very inquiring about people and he painstakingly recorded her predictions in his journal, revealing both the gist of their questions and her intuition about these three young men's expectations. George, she said, was to have two wives, three children, to be married in three years, to have very good fortune in the latter part of his days. She sensed that he had many private enemies, and she described one of them to him very right. She told young Jonathan Rice that he would have very good luck as he entered his 21st year, enjoy very good luck upon the water, marry in three years, and share his life with one wife and six children. As for Zuriel, he was to have two wives, if not three, with four or five children. Not only did he have but few enemies, Zuriel wrote, recorded, he would have every 
he would have very good luck in a little time and have everything to my wish and be settled down when I am 27 years old. He also noted the old woman's assurance that I have seen the girl I am to have, a tall lass, slender, fair, merry, and sociable, and will see her again for long. With the domestic predictions completed, she further told me that I should have good luck upon the water in a little voyage or a privateering, but not to go on long voyages or continue going to sea. She anticipated that Zuriel Waterman would be as good as his name and would have an offer to go privateering in three weeks or three days or two weeks or two days. The thing with fortune tellers is you can't be too specific, but it I see the number two. Zuriel was destined to take his war onto the water. And indeed, the following month, Zuriel sailed on a privateer sloop. These predictions and Zuriel Waterman's detailed record of them showed these young men's expectations in the midst of a revolutionary war. First, they look to a domestic future, looking for glimpses of a respectable manhood fulfilled by marriage and children. Predict predictions about merry wives, sociable wives, pretty wives, that's certainly welcome. But more importantly, these fortunes offered young men tactical advice on how to advance in life. And most importantly, and no matter how lightheartedly they asked, they sought guidance about whether military service could lead them safely to respectability and prosperity, and what kind of military service. As young men, Zuriel, George, and Jonathan sought the resources and the relationships that marked the transition to the next stage of their lives. And to achieve these goals, they were ready to balance the opportunities and dangers of war with delicacy and some nerve. <laughs>